This is Evening News for Thursday, October 31, 2013. I'm Samuel Suknandan. Thanks for joining us. Making the headlines tonight. Armed police, CT constable ranks remove wormy meat from Japs. Fire ravages comfort sleep and payless bonds it echoes. Caribbean parliaments urge closer relations as biennial conference concludes. A government still wants sixth form school as 17th national awards ceremony held. Former Foreign Affairs Minister says Borders Committee could be a useful tool and Gender Equality Commission to establish investigative center. And now for the news in detail. The Ghana Police Force and officials from the Georgetown Mayor and City Council today swooped down on the Japs Meat Center after receiving complaints about worms being found in meat. Whitney Prasad was on the scene and filed this report. Members of the Ghana Police Force along with City Council officials today swooped down on the Japs Meat Center with a search warrant after receiving complaints of lack of sanitary and cytosanitary conditions at the facility. After hours of waiting at the scene of the alleged crime to speak with investigators with the hope of getting a possible report from police and council officials on spot, the evening news was turned down. But ranks were seen fetching out the alleged spoiled meat out of the Japs Meat Center on Rob Street hours after the investigation begun. Persons working within the vicinity of the meat center told this newscast that the proprietor of the business was allegedly regularly purchasing questionable types of meat that was nonetheless still being sold to the Guyanese public. The fines of the police did not shock them, but they lauded the work of the authorities to close the doors of the meat center. Reports reaching the evening news allege that after receiving information of imported meat that has not been stamped and is being sold at the facility, the Ghana Police Force sought the assistance of City Council to launch an investigation. Van loads of armed police ranks flocked the meat center and began to search the premises for what, according to the people nearby, were junks of meat that contained worms. A senior council official who spoke with this newscast said that the meat center was buying meat from countries that are not in keeping with the standards of the Food and Drug Analyst Department, FDA. The source said this could pose a serious threat to the lives of the Guyanese populace if by chance the alleged imported meat being sold was infected. The proprietor has been taken into custody at the Brickdown Police Station to assist with further investigation. When the evening news turned up at the scene after receiving reports, police ranks were seen conducting checks and it has been asserted that a finding has been made, but the police declined to say. Reporting for the evening news from Rob Street at the Jobsmith Centre, Whitney Prasad. The evening news was on the scene at last evening's fire, which ravaged comfort sleep and payless bonds at their Eccles industrial site location. The inferno started at around 18 hours 35 and scores of persons flocked the scene as firefighters earnestly tried to prevent the blaze from spreading to nearby buildings. Here is this joint report from Whitney Persaud and Svetlana Marshall. Behind me is a raging fire that has consumed the payless and comfortably bond at Eccles Industrial Site. Join with me as we talk to eyewitnesses and owners of these businesses. I, I was home, I believe, this afternoon around about, uh, about um, 6 30 because we had some trucks to load and stuff, and we make sure everything was okay. When we leave and thing, I left the security, we check and everything was all right. When I get home, <laughs> I receive a phone call that. Someone said the building next door doesn't find any axe. The security, what happened? He said that the building, the first start from uh, the store over there, Payless. I got the news that this stockyard is on fire, so we rushed down when it's already got it. Everything lost over there. All our raw materials, all of our chemicals to make the foam, those are where we store it over there. It's all gone. Could you say or give an estimation of the amount of losses or anything? Yes, a million, millions. How much are employees? Uh, it's twelve to five of us. Twelve to five. And this is a big group for the company. It is. It is at this time. We're wrong this time here. It is. <laughs> With all the orders we had back up to fulfill, <laughs> both local and overseas. Nobody will be out of a job. Everybody will remain having a job at Comfort Sleep. And then we'll know. Then we discovered it like a lot of smoke in the air. And then we watch, we see red. 
-hmm. And we come around, but the place was already on fire. So it was in this building or it already spread to the other building? It was at the back of the building. The back the of the building. Yeah. So by the time we come around here, feel like access to the building. We cannot spread to any other buildings. We are inside this one, you know, and we have it under control. And the one there has already been destroyed. So at present, the fire cannot spread. It's under control. It's under control. Standing with me is the former Minister of Tourism, Industry and Commerce, Mr. Mansour Nadir. I know that the industry would have expanded under your stewardship. Comfort Sleep is a business that I know almost all my life. Because the owner and I grew up in James Street or Boyston. So Dennis Charan, the owner of Comfort Sleep, we go back a long way. It's been two decades of hard work that he has put into building this business. And I know over the many years he had expressed concern about storing the chemicals that are used to make the foam away from where the factory is. And seeing what has happened today, his fears, yes, did materialize. But on the other side, because he took the bold step to separate the storage of the chemicals from the factory. He saved the main production facility and more particularly for me today would have been the amount of jobs that will continue in operation tomorrow. Approximately one hour after the fire started, firefighters are still battling to keep it under control. Reporting from the scene of the fire, I am Swatlana Marshall. Meanwhile, Fire Chief Marlon Gentle said there have been no new leads into the investigation of the Comfort Sleep and Payless Store fire, which occurred last evening. During an interview with the Evening News, Gentle said that investigations are still ongoing as they interview eyewitnesses and collect evidence at the Eccles Industrial Site location on the east bank of Demerara. The Comfort Sleep administrative staff Amanda Chung said that the owner, Dennis Turan, will be in the country until Saturday to speak to the media forder. The 16th Biennial Regional Conference of Presiding Officers and Clerks of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association has come to an end with regional parliaments pledging to create greater partnerships aimed at learning more from each other and educating people about parliament. Details in this report. Speaker of the National Assembly, Raphael Trotman, said the conference has proven to be a huge success. Trotman said that the conference covered a wide range of topics that were all relevant to each participating member states. Three resolutions were passed, adopted. This is the first because in the past, uh, conferences ended just with good remarks and pledges to continue the agendas and the discussions that we started, but we thought it was important to have three resolutions passed. The conference concluded with the passage of three resolutions. The first is to see the establishment of an executive steering committee to coordinate activities among conferences, the next to be held in 2015 in Bermuda. Other initiatives include parliamentary outreach programs aimed at youth education, having recognized the need for greater intra-regional cooperation. Barbados Speaker Michael Carrington, who said that the conference was indeed a success, extended thanks to the Parliament and Government of Guyana for hosting the 16th conference. The speakers also pledged to continuity of work undertaken and passed a resolution calling for countries to ratify the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons Living with Disabilities. The conference was held here in Guyana from October 28 to 30 under the theme The Role of Parliaments as They Meet the Challenges of Evolving Democracies. Sabatini Daniels reporting for the Evening news. Retired diplomat and former foreign affairs minister Rudy Insanali believes that a permanent national borders commission could be useful enforcement in addressing border issues, but he warned that any such body would have to speak with one voice for it to be effective. The details in this report. Former Foreign Minister Rudy Insanali's comments on the establishment of a border commission come in wake of recent calls by a leader of the opposition, David Granger, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to establish such to boost institutional strengthening on issues regarding Guyana's territorial integrity. Granger had made a similar proposal when he had met with Professor Norman Gervin last year, who was recently reappointed by United Nations General Secretary Ban Ki-moon as his personal representative to support him 
in his role as the UN good officer in the Guyana Venezuela border matter. Contacted for a comment on the issue, Presidential Advisor on Governance Gil Tashira directed this newscast of Foreign Affairs Minister Carlin Rodriguez Burkett, who is overseas. Director General of the Foreign Ministry Elizabeth Harper would not give a comment when approached. Insanali said the Border Commission was intended to be a multi-partisan body representing various individuals. He said it met and offered views on how some of the issues could be handled. He stressed, however, that it will be up to the parties to see whether a revived commission could serve any purpose in the ongoing borders problem Guyana has with Venezuela and Suriname. As to the usefulness of such a body, Ensenali said it could come up with ideas and can also be another think tank for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He insisted that if the Border Commission could be truly representative, it would be a force for unity. Following the recent standoff between Venezuela and Guyana over the seizure of a seismic vessel in Guyana's waters, Granger called on President Donald Ramatar to reconvene the Border and National Security Committee. This, he believes, will create avenues for Guyana and Venezuela to resolve some of the recent territorial controversies. For the evening news, Leanna Bradshaw. Sabatini Daniels now joins us to report that the Education Ministry today hosted its 17th National Award Ceremony for its stand-in performances. Here are the details. Janelle James and Melody Lowe, the top performers of this year's Advanced Proficiency Examination CAPE, along with Yukita Pesod and Cecil Cox, the top performers of Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate, CSEC, were awarded with the President's Scholarship Awards this year. This follows President Donald Ramatar's announcement at the last year's award ceremony that the top two performers of CSEC and CAPE would automatically qualify for scholarships to study in Guyana or abroad. Other top performers of the National Grade 6 Assessment, CSEC, CAPE, Carnegie School of Home Economics, Guyana Technical Examination and Government Technical Education Examination were also given awards. Delivering the feature address at the event, Prime Minister Samuel Hines said government feels rewarded and vindicated by the student's success. The government seeks to ensure that every region, every sub-district within every region receives these resources equally. What is given to children in terms of textbooks at Paramatatoy is also given to children in Christianburg, as is given to children in Maikoli and Crabble Creek. The resources like chalk and cardboard that teachers need are given equally across the sector too. He also recognized that in some schools there are more trained teachers than others, noting that government is aggressively working to tackle this issue. Education Minister Priya Manikchan stated that these performances are representations of the new Guyana. You are the children, you are the people of tomorrow who could take this and take our country and fashion it in the way you would like to see it turn out. You get to decide what Guyana's tomorrow looks like. You get to decide what we look like 20 years from now. The minister also slammed the opposition parties for failing to congratulate the top performers and teachers for their accomplishments. Sabatini Daniels reporting for the Evening News. The Ghana Road Safety Council is concerned that there has been a vast influx of vehicles on the roadways even as road space remains limited. And it is believed that the expansion of the East Coast and East Bank highways would be an integral step in overcoming this. Here's more. Acting Chairman of the Ghana National Road Safety Council, Norman McLean, said 10 to 12,000 vehicles are brought onto Ghana's roadways yearly, but roadways remain slim. This, he said, creates higher risks for accidents to occur. This, among other concerns plaguing the traffic department, was raised at a press conference today to highlight plans for Road Safety Month 2013. Meanwhile, according to Chairman of the West Demerara Road Safety Association, Shahab Haq, the time has come for no letting up and the body will continue to take the necessary measures to reduce accidents. However, they are calling on corporate Ghana to get on board to assist in funding their ventures. The council also raised concerns that the police traffic department does not have the sufficient tools and equipment to put measures in place to prevent road accidents. We have recognized that they are ill-equipped to do the job. For instance, on my side, on the West Zemrara, the police, they don't have flashers. They're stopping traffic in the night with their hands. They're not visible, they don't have vests, they don't have cones, they don't have enough breathalyzers. 
So we are trying to make whatever we can make available to them. As it relates to breathalyzers, the council believes it is needed at every police station across the country, which is not the situation that currently obtains. I know for a fact, I, I give you a good example. There's a man who had an accident on the East Coast. There was no breathalyzer on the East Coast. They brought him to, to Georgetown, like they didn't have the breathalyzer there, it wasn't working. They took him over to West Demerara uh, because theirs was working. So, so that's uh, how um, limited that issue. And in the meantime, of course, you're sobering up. <laughs> if, you, if you had a few drinks you by the time they you have the time on your take club. you from there to bring you to Georgetown to carry you across the river, or what have you, you're sobering up by then. So it just tells you uh, how limited are our resources. These should be available uh, everywhere, at every station. Road Safety Month 2013 will get underway with a major launching activity tomorrow in front of the Parliament Square to guarantee wide public viewership. There will be a simulation exercise depicting an accident and effects of it to send off a message to the viewing public. 83 deaths caused by 77 road accidents have been recorded thus far for 2013 compared to 89 in 2012. The accidents are said to have been the result of speeding and driving under the influence of alcohol. Join us after these messages for more of the news. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the Evening News. The Ghana Elections Commission, GCOM, said that it has enough finance for the hosting of local government elections whenever the time comes. More in this report. We hardly ever, when elections, uh, where elections are concerned, have problems with financing. Uh, I mean, parties would be going crazy if uh, GCOM were not financed uh, adequately and timely for these matters. I can't recall, and it is already 12 years, uh, I can't recall in the elections preparations that we have made and we have carried out that we ever had uh, any problems with money. That was Chairman of the Ghana Elections Commission, Dr. Steve Surajbali, explaining GCOM's readiness for local government polls, particularly as it relates to financing. Meanwhile, the Commission is currently carrying out the fifth cycle of continuous registration exercise. Dr. Suraj Bali said by the end of this cycle, it is expected that some 20,000 more persons will be added to the list of registrants. Relative to the demarcation of the boundaries, that is fantastic. Uh, we have some cosmetics to be done, uh, to do, and uh, I dare say that will be done correctly in due course. Commenting on whether the Commission has started educating citizens on the local government reform legislation, he said that GCOM is making preparation to start soon. Documents and DVDs for television stations have been prepared for distribution throughout the country, with about 100,000 brochures about the new local government system. Dr. Suraj Bali said besides being financially ready, his entity is fully equipped and ready to stage the long-anticipated local government elections. The GCOM chairman explained that certain statutory provisions will have to be made in order to move ahead with the successful hosting of these elections nonetheless. However, President Donald Ramatar has still not ascended to four local government reform bills, the Fiscal Transfers Bill 2012, the Municipal and District Councils Amendment Bill 2012, the Local Government Amendment Bill 2012, and the Local Government Commission Bill, which were all passed by the National Assembly during the previous sit-in. For the Evening News, I'm Samuel Suknandan. The University of Ghana Student Society has moved to reform its financial management system after it had experienced some difficulties during last year. The details in this story. President of the University of Ghana Student Society Richard Rambran said that systems have been put in place to create a more sound financial system for the student body in the future. Reflecting on the previous occurrence that saw the society's former president Ganesh Mahipol borrowing close to $800,000, he said that the previous system allowed that to happen. He explained that the incident occurred as a result of the insistence of a few members of the UGSS to be allowed full access to all financing available to the body from the UG administration. This system has changed this year, whereby we have to revert to the, to the method that was previously employed whereby you have to 
provide your list of financial expenditure that you hope to have for this block of money that you're going to deal with and then you have another list of financial expenditures that you're going to hope to deal with with this block of money so therein you have a continuous accounting method that you as a student society are subjected to by the by the, uh, the the legislation or by the requisites of the University of Guyana student the University of Guyana administration Rambran explained that the new system requires that executives of the UGSS provide a list to the internal auditor before funds can be dispersed during April former UGSS president Ganesh Mahipal was accused of embezzling eight hundred thousand dollars of the student body's funds and admitted only to borrowing the money to offset personal expenses Mahipal explained that contrary to reports of misappropriation of the society's fund, the $800,000 was borrowed under the correct procedure as stipulated under the constitution governing the society. Mahipal stated that as stipulated by the UGSS constitution, he went ahead and borrowed the money from the society, noting that several executive members were aware of the loan. He later paid back the monies in full. For the Evening News, I'm Samuel Suknandan. The Rights of the Child Commission and the United Nations Children Fund, UNICEF, are now embarking on a campaign to get the views of children and youth as they seek to form another policy to boost their participation in development. Swetlana Marshall reports. The Rights of the Child Commission and the United Nations Children Fund, UNICEF, concluded a two-day seminar today at the Regency Hotel, forming part of a countrywide consultation ahead of the drafting of a national framework on child and youth participation. On Wednesday, students were given the opportunity to express their views on the topic inclusion. NPAC consultant from Haiti, Joanne Garnier Lafrenton, who is aiding in the process, said the framework will provide a vivid picture on the importance of child participation and the required steps to be taken through the eyes of children. And they will share their experience about what is already happening at family level, at school level, and in the communities as to um, how children are already participating in the decisions and what can be done to improve that. So they will come with their own concept of child participation and they will see um, what the convention says, what are the provisions of the convention, what others are doing throughout the world. Garnier Lefronton said Guyana has already instituted key steps to protect the rights of children, noting that a framework will advance the process. I think that it's the beginning really of a new paradigm. Um, and it's a, I'm not going to say it's a new beginning for Guyana because there has been a lot achieved here already as regard to child participation. We're talking about um, children parliament, the youth parliament, but also the students govern, um, government in the schools. So I think it's a way to do better. A lot has been done, but it's a way as well to look at the future. Work on the framework commenced months ago. However, the consultation process only got on the way this week. The framework is being drafted in accordance with Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which states that children are capable of forming their own views. Additionally, it states that a child should be provided the opportunity to be heard in any judicial and administrative proceedings. Reporting for the Evening News, I am Swetlana Marshall. Today, a man was sentenced to three years imprisonment after he appeared before Chief Magistrate Priya Suniran Bahari at the Georgetown Magistrates Court to answer to two charges against him. 38-year-old Alex Persaud pleaded guilty to the charges which stated that on October 28 at Stabrook Market, Georgetown, he had in his possession one gram of cocaine for the purpose of trafficking along with a utensil used for smoking cocaine. In addition, the three years to the two, three years imprisonment, Chief Magistrate Sunarine Bahari fined him $15,000 for the possession of the utensil and $30,000 for the possession of the cocaine, a total of $45,000. Join us after these messages for more of the news. Welcome back and now for a look at some more news. 
Education Minister Priya Manichan said government is still looking to establish a sixth form school in the country to provide adequate space for students wishing to sit the Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examination, CAPE. Sabatini Daniels has the details. Speaking to this newscast during an interview, Minister Priya Manikchan said the setting up of the school is under active consideration. She emphasized that this is something she hopes will become a reality. Manikchan highlighted that there are a number of issues which government must examine before establishing such a school. One of the disadvantages is um, that the teachers who teach CAPE, they also teach other courses and um, other grades and levels in the same school. So we have to do some balancing. It's However, she said the advantages of setting up the school are that all CAPE students would be in one school, there would be no overcrowding, and it would aid them to transition between CXC and university. She stated that somewhere close to the University of Guyana is being eyed to establish the school. At the 15th National Education Awards Ceremony, former Education Minister Sheikh Baksh had announced plans to create a sixth form school here. Sabatini Daniels reporting for the Evening News. Today, a businessman made his first court appearance at the Georgetown Magistrates Court after he was charged with unlawful wounding. Howard Mothers pleaded not guilty to the charge, which stated that on October 28, at Meadowbank, he unlawfully and maliciously wounded William Hardin as it was read against him. There were no objections to bail raised by Prosecutor Barrett Mangrew, and Mothers was placed on his own recognizance. The matter is set to return to court on November 21. The Women and Gender Equality Commission has expressed concern about the seemingly increasing levels of gender-based violence in Guyana. The commission is therefore proposing the establishment of an investigative center in this regard. More in this report. Chairperson of the Women and Gender Equality Commission, Indra Chanderpal, said the body has recognized an increase in the number of gender-based violence taking place across Guyana, which requires the setting up of a center for investigation of gender-based and family violence. And this is similar to the Center for Investigation on Sexual Offenses and Child Abuse, SISOCA. It's a model that has been put in place in Jamaica, and we are seeking a meeting with the president to discuss this matter because we believe it is the way that we ought to go in discussing and in dealing with the issue of gender-based and domestic violence. In light of this, she said the commission will be engaging in discussions with a number of state and civil society groups to introduce the idea of an investigative center and establish a working group. Chandra Paul said the initiative stemmed from recommendations that emerged from the Access to Justice Public Education Forum that was conducted in all administrative regions. She added that another such activity is slated to be held on November 14 in Region 8, where the Director of Public Prosecutions will be on hand to provide information on access to justice for gender-based violence. This time around, the Commission will be engaging 45 schools. And what we have sought to do is to get all our commissioners to identify three schools, either primary or secondary school, um, in which they can um, deal with the issue of violence. And we are preparing our notes to deal specifically with the children that we will be reaching out at these various schools. Meanwhile, member of the Commission, Van der Radzik, highlighted that the Commission is currently drafting a Memorandum of Understanding with the University of Ghana to establish a Center of Gender Studies through online courses. We expressed our desire to support one UG student to do research per year, and the Art Commission would pay the tuition fees for them to do a research on gender women's rights, a related, a, a related matter. And we're hoping that this would continue on an ongoing basis. For the Evening News, Leanna Bradshaw. Join us after these messages for your Evening News Sportcast, sponsored by Macor. Welcome back. And now for a look at sport in your headlines. 
President Ramatar pledges government's commitment to football. Kashif in Shanghai launches secondary school tournament. And Chandrapol and Dinarain among the runs for West Indies in warm-up. History was created last evening at Thirst Park when President Donald Ramatar became the only Guyanese to lay a hand on the prestigious Solid Gold FIFA World Cup trophy, a right only bestowed on the head of state of any given country and the World Cup winners. The trophy was on a one-day visit here as part of a nine-month eight-country tour ahead of the 2014 World Cup in neighboring Brazil. Avinash Ramzan reports. <laughs> Guyana. Prior to unveiling the trophy at a gala reception at the Bangs GI8 Sports Club, His Excellency said he is proud to be the chosen one to lift football's most coveted prize on behalf of all Guyanese. And I think that that would be the old saying that common events cast their shadows. That really would be the common event of Guyana winning the World Cup one day. This is that shadow that I hope to cast when we will lift the trophy, when the Golden Jaguar will one day lift the trophy as being one of the Caribbean champions in this game. The head of state further stated that the arrival of the trophy should serve to inspire all Guyanese and create a harmonious environment since the game of football teaches teamwork and the successes that can be derived from working in unison. And that's why I propose to try to get the opposition in my own team so that we can score some serious goals on behalf of our country. And that is some of the lessons that sports generally teach us. Ramatar was later presented with a replica of the FIFA World Cup by FIFA Ambassador Dwight York, the former Trinidad and Tobago, Manchester United and Aston Villa forward. Chairman and Managing Director of Banks DIH Limited, Clifford Rees, echoed similar sentiments, noting that Guyana should aim to achieve those heights that other football nations have reached over the years. As difficult as it may be for some to consider that Guyana may one day field a team to compete in the future FIFA World Cup football events. This should not deter us from pursuing that most noble understanding to create the conditions whereby Guyana will be able to send a team to the World Cup to the ambassadors representing our country, Guyana, before the rest of the world in the future. The discipline and resulting benefits which will accrue can only be to the benefit of Guyana. Brazilian Ambassador Luis Gilberto Sejas Andre said his country embraces the staging of the FIFA World Cup next year since it promotes peace, international understanding and goodwill and also helps to create ties among nations. Brazil also sees these mega sporting events as an opportunity to foster social inclusion as well as a powerful instrument in the fight against racial, ethnic and gender discrimination. Brazil is getting ready to warmly welcome thousands of football fans from all over the world who will congregate in harmony at 12 Brazilian host cities in June and July next year. This is the third time that the original FIFA World Cup trophy is going on tour around the world. Following tours in 2006 and 2010, the 2013-2014 tour will visit 89 countries during its 267-day duration. It was developed through an exclusive partnership between FIFA and Coca-Cola, one of FIFA's longest-standing corporate partners. In a move geared at nurturing young talents, the Kashif in Shanghai organization has launched a secondary school football tournament set to kick off on December 8 and conclude on January 1, 2014. Details from Avinash Ramzan. The secondary school tournament is a switch from 23 years of hosting senior club football, but co-director of the Kashif and Shanghai organization, Kashif Mohammed, says, and I quote, nothing has changed, end quote. Under the new Guyana Football Federation administration, led by Christopher Matthias, the Kashif and Shanghai organization was required to submit to the governing body conformance to a number of prerequisites in order to be given permission to stage the traditional year-end competition, much of which they have failed to adhere to. We got Anson McCall, we got Mohammed's Enterprise, we got the same press, we got everybody, the same media, everybody's here, the same book that I used to write down. Every single thing, my whole list of things to do, my every single thing, every single thing, it just continues the same way. The only thing is that we're looking at the younger Golden Jaguars. 
That's basically a thing, and no changes with what's going on. Everything remained the same. BL is still here. Sparrow is the only man in there. <laughs> Brian McCarthy there right now. You understand? Um, who else? Raul Tony came in a little late, so we got Mark Young as the PRO. So basically, this is the same program, and we're fighting hard to make it um, equally as successful and even better. Unlike the senior tournament, Mohammed claims the organization was not required to get permission from the Ghana Football Federation and as such has received the blessings of the Education Ministry. Um, this tournament, we did not have to get the permission from the um, GFF to do this tournament. We had to ask the ministry because it's school's football, but we did inform the Guyana Football Federation. As a matter of fact, we invited the Guyana Football Federation to send a representative here today. Um, because of how you know we were running a little based a little tight with time, um, the invitation to GFF went a bit late, but you know, we try to make sure that it's there. The Kashifan Shanghai organization is partnering with several entities, including Ansimakal Trading, Bihari Group of Companies, Pepsi and Mohammed's Enterprise, to stage the twenty four team tournament. So it's our pleasure to be here to be able to start be with the um, tournament get into the schools, see the talent that is in the schools, and then get these guys to develop that talent in such a way that when they come out, when they get out of school and they can join a club, they can excel because they already have been formed at the school level. Now, this, this really is, is a plus for education. I think we now have a rather full calendar year when it comes to football in particular not just at the secondary level, but also, as you were well aware, at the um, lower primary level with the peewee football um, currently going on and with plans to extend that right through the year. The competition will feature 24 teams, including the top eight from the Digicel Schools Football Championship. The top four teams will receive cash prizes to aid a project of their choice at their respective schools, while the most valuable player will be assigned to a major club in Trinidad and Tobago for a one-month stint. West Indies batsmen kicked off their tour to India with promising signs with four of their top six getting past the half-century mark on day one of the warm-up match against Uttar Pradesh in Kolkata. While Kieran Powell, 64, and Darren Bravo, 61, couldn't push on after getting set, Shiv Narayan Chandrapal, 91, not out, and Narsing Dinarayan, 83, not out, have the opportunity to register confidence-boosting hundreds on day two. Their 170 runs stand for the fifth wicket meant that the West Indies finished the first day on a comfortable 333 for four. Meanwhile, Rohit Sharma, who is yet to make his test debut, has been included in India's squad for the first in two tests against the West Indies. The squad is Mahindra Singh Dhoni, captain, along with other players. With the identity of several persons who were reportedly elected to serve on the executive of the Demerara Cricket Board, DCB, still unknown following its January 25 elections this year, this newscast has been able to obtain the names of six members. Rajiv Bisnod has been following the issue and has the details in this report. The identity of six alleged Demerara Cricket Board officials were revealed after months of speculation and probing pertaining to the identity of several persons who were reportedly elected to serve on the executive of the DCB following its January 25th elections this year. Their identities were revealed even as the East Coast Cricket Board and the Georgetown Cricket Association are moving to the courts to file contempt proceedings against a set of persons who have allegedly shown disregard for an injunction granted by the Honorable Justice Diane Insanali back in January this year. Since the controversial elections, the board has failed to reveal the identities of those who have been given a mandate of running the entity. The failure to reveal the identities of a new board has led to growing criticisms about the reasons behind the secrecy and lack of transparency about the internal affairs of the DCB. The board's head, Rajendra Singh, recently dismissed any perception that there was any secrecy surrounding the identity of the members of the DCB, but rather it is linked to several pending court cases. Meanwhile, efforts are being made to obtain the names of the other members acting on behalf of the DCB. Remember, you can read about these and other stories in tomorrow's edition of the Ghana Times newspaper, which can be picked up from vendors across the country. When you're not reading our newspaper or watching TVG Channel 28, do tune into RGI on 89.3, 89.5 or 89.7 FM. Join us after these messages for your bridge reports.
Welcome back and now for a look at your bridge reports. The Demo Harbour Bridge will be closed on Friday, November 1 at 14 hours 34 period of one and a half hours. And the Burbies River Bridge will be closed on Friday, November 1 at 14 hours 50 for a period of one and a half hours. That's your Thursday, October 31, 2013 edition of the Evening News. I'm Samuel Suknandin. Thanks for joining us.